My lords, ladies, and gentlemen, may I have your attention. Let me say a personal word of welcome to the March Special Lecture Series 1983, Torts in the 80s. This March Special Lecture Series is, has been called and is the flagship of the continuing legal education endeavors of the Law Society of Upper Canada. It will be opened by the treasurer, upon whom I will call now Mr. John D. Bowlby, QC, to say a few words. It is a uh, pleasure for me to open the Law Society's March Special Lectures. There are, as you know, some and perhaps many to whom age seems to usher in a conviction that longevity is accompanied by the acquisition of knowledge by some osmosis rather than requiring continued labor. They use their le learning processes what learning processes have given them up to a certain year to form a wall behind which they stay, proclaiming that little lies outside. I have never been sure in my own mind whether I feel pity or great envy for the smugness that seems to be life's gift to uh, such persons. However, on balance, I'm sure it must be right that one of life's most frustrating and yet exciting prospects is the ever-mounting realization of how profound is our ignorance when balanced against what is to be learned. Uh, may I first apologize for imposing such simplistic philosophy at so early an hour and on such a beautiful morning upon you, but they may be somewhat appropriate to serve as the beginnings for such a splendid series of lectures which lie before you. This will be the third occasion upon which I have been honored because of my position as treasurer rather than any scholastic attainment to open these series of lectures. I have said before and will repeat that one of the bonuses accompanying this office for me has been the opportunity to, to meet with so many of our profession and to realize how truly inquisitive we lawyers really are. If I am asked one thing more repetitively than any other. It is how can programs such as these be expanded? It is rewarding to realize how committed solicitors are to attempting to keep abreast with some fragment of the changes which are taking place at such a dizzy pace in so many fields of law. We have seen in the last few years very exciting expansions in the manner in which our legal societies, bar association, and your law society have accelerated its attempts to satisfy this thirst. The symposium just completed a few weeks ago at the Thompson Center serves as a glaringly exciting example of how persons possessing superb expertise can be combined with a display of scientific advances in demonstrative technique to educate in an interesting and thoroughly enjoyable fashion. The lectures which you are privileged to hear in the next two days concern themselves with new directions uh, our law is chartering in the field of tortious liability. And this is certainly an area of law to which I can readily identify. Since it is to the law of torts, which I and my brothers and sisters 
can thank for a relatively spoiled youth. It comprising as it did a large percentage of my father's practice. Now, George Walsh stories are still told and will, because of the unique uniqueness of his character, be repeated for so many years to come. As many of you know, he practiced negligence law in the 30s and 40s with great success, becoming a bencher and a Supreme Court judge prior to his death. My main memory of him was being introduced uh, when I was still in my teens and being impressed by the fact that he spoke as if his words came from a Gatling machine gun. My father used to say his, mind, his speech mirrored the speed of his mental, mental functioning. One story that is told, uh, uh, that is told that his son, George, who like his father, is now a Supreme Court judge, came home having received a low mark at Christmas exam in torts. George Sr., when learning of this, marched him into his study and said, George, George, look around you. This room, these walls, that ceiling, all exist because of the law of torts. <laughs> this, this morning also reminds me of another who taught so many of us this subject, that person, of course, being Caesar Augustus Wright. The only word I can grope for in trying to describe one of his lectures is electrifying. If after spending a year listening to the innovative, imaginative, and stunningly brilliant approach he brought to the study of torts, it would be almost impossible not to maintain some interest in this segment of the law no matter into what area you eventually settle. I have gone on much too long, and I see in the program listed so many friends of mine who rightfully gained such a high level, who have rightfully gained such a high level of respect in tort law. And I know you appreciate the time they have set aside to be amongst you here. And the Law Society, through me, conveys its appreciation along with yours for their participation, which can only leave you richer in a field which holds such true fascination. As treasurer, may I also extend your society's deep sense of gratitude to Bruce Noble, Dick Shibley, Mr. Justice Linden, Earl Cherniak, Ian Oderbridge, Ted Racklin, and of course, our director of CLE, George Collins Williams, for putting this lecture series together. To organize such a program only may appear easy because of the skill of those who put it together. But from one who has seen such programs move from the drawing board to the actual event, believe me, such is decidedly not the case. Thank you very much. Good morning and uh, good learning. Now it is my brief but very pleasant duty to introduce your chairman for today, Mr. Bruce Noble. Bruce has labored over the past months, as the treasurer has said, uh, taking a major role in putting this program together. You're going to work hard over the next two and a half days, and uh, I think you shall enjoy it and profit from it. Now, I'm going to be brief in my introduction, as Bruce has, entitled, has invited me to be. Bruce Noble came into law through the University of Toronto, and because I'm a Vic man, through Victoria College. He was in honor law and in political science, and uh, entered the Osgoode Hall Law School, 
and uh, finished that in 1956 with a class one standing. I like that. He articled with Les the late Leslie Blackwell and upon graduation worked for a short time with that firm and then moved to his <coughs> own city, the city which has become his city, Sault Ste. Marie. He is a partner and the managing partner in the firm of Wishart Noble, which he joined when he went there in 1957 and engages in an active, busy practice from that time until today in that city. He is a member of so many uh, associations and, and uh, public service groups that I don't intend to go through them, but I do want to say what he does for the Law Society of Upper Canada. He was elected a bencher in 1979 and serves on the following standing committees, continuing legal education, my committee, he's one of my bosses. Uh, the Insurance and Practice Committee, the Discipline Committee, and the Compensation Fund Committee. He's Vice Chairman of Legal Aid for the Province of Ontario and has served and, and worked hard for several other committees and community groups. A number of memberships, only one of which I'm going to name because it fascinates me, the Algoma Steel Men's Club. Thank you. <laughs> Bruce? <clears throat> Thank you very much, sir. <clears throat> Thank you, George. I think I should say, really, I, I feel strange sitting up here. I sat so long on the other side of this podium, I feel a little unnatural, but it's a pleasure to have you all here, and thank you for coming. I hope you find this series of lectures as exciting um, and stimulating as we who put it together uh, thought it might be. And I particularly thank you for coming today uh, in the realization that uh, the practice of law has many demands on your financial uh, purse, and it is indeed uh, a sacrifice to come to these continuing legal education programs, not only in uh, time, but in money. I hope that you will uh, get full value for what you have spent in coming here. Uh, the first speaker today uh, is uh, a man whom I would call our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Thomas F. Lambert. Uh, Tom was educated at the University of California, Los Angeles. He received three Pacific Coast Speaking Championships. <coughs> Excuse me, he was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University, where he obtained two law degrees. One would have thought one would have been enough. He completed the graduate law work at Yale, and uh, something very interesting to me, and you might find it so, he had two assignments at the Nuremberg trial. He wrote the United States brief against the Nazi party and presented to the tribunal the United States case against the defendant Martin Bormann, chief of the Nazi party under Hitler and the executive member under Hitler. And both Bormann and the party were convicted. Appointed uh, Dean Roscoe Pound as his successor as editor-in-chief of the American Trial Lawyers Association, and he's held that post for 27 years. He's held the Lambert and Down chair at Suffolk University. He, in his curriculum vitae, indicates he's inflicted talks on the bar associations in all of the 50 states, most of them as often as 25 times. He's visited Canadian bar groups on at least a dozen of occasions. At 26, he was appointed Dean of Stetson University College of Law in California. He was the youngest dean in the history of American legal education. And it is uh, regretful, but I think I should indicate to you the quality and caliber of this man. He must lecture again tonight in Boston, Massachusetts, and therefore, regretfully, uh, we will lose him as soon as he has completed his, his talk here today. And would you help me welcome Professor Tom Lambert. <laughs> great and good friend, Mr. Justice Linden, and fellow students of tort law. Your generosity in inviting me is now being matched by your 
charity in listening to me. In all truth, I should disclose what I think <clears throat> lies behind this privileged opportunity for me. It's my friend Ted Rackley, who, uh, boring from within, I think, brought off this invitation. And he called me on the phone and he said, now, Tom, these are your instructions. Be brief, be practical, be funny, be philosophic, and be through. He made, his, made himself perfectly clear. Just one minute, sir. I'll give you an extra time. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I always enjoy uh, coming to Toronto, Canada, and my favorite place and of all the places I've inflicted talks has been Osgood Hall. Many times uh, I go there to expose the heresies and obfuscations of uh, Alan Linden and my great and good friend R.J. Gray. Uh, once we had a very vigorous exchange on the platform there, and I said, Alan, why does it take you much longer than it takes me to say something? And he says, because it is more difficult to refute error than to formulate it. <laughs> kind of. Okay. So all I can say is drawing on uh, Dr. Johnson, who once observed uh, concerning the 20th marriage of a friend, he said it was the triumph of hope over experience. <laughs> And while I cannot understand why I should be favored with renewed invitations, I must say I rejoice in them. My little topic is Tort Law 2003, and I think it's obviously rash, not to say foolhardy, to try to predict uh, the future in this great subject of tort law. Tort law, as we all know, is always in the process of becoming. It owes more to Darwin than it does to Newton. It's not a cadaver. It's a living thing. The growth, of course, is usually imperceptible, like the coral reef. But every now and then, we realize that torts have birthdays. And there's a development that is visible, avowed, and clear, just as you can have volcanic upthrust, and an island can be born before your eyesight. Torts do indeed have birthdays. And yet, especially when I look on the present administration of the United States, it is obvious that there's a worldwide shortage of Sears and sages, the past is so murky, the future so misty, it is only the past that can be predicted with confidence. And yet I am satisfied that you can divide the tort law developments facing us now into three areas. One I'd call a, an area of stable doctrine. I mean, IDS was good law in 1348 when that irate, thirsty highwayman who was told by the tavern keeper's wife, get lost, there's no grog for tonight, and he made a pass at her with a hatchet. We don't know whether he was trying to cleave her from the crown to the crotch, but it was what the RAF would call a near miss, and she successfully maintained her action for actionable assault. Good law in 1348 good law now and in the future. There's an area of stable doctrine. Then there is an area of tort law that is under assault, and I think may be in for retreat and retrenchment. You take the most dynamic area of tort law in the states today, products liability, or the liability of product suppliers for harm from flawed or defective products, there's a massive assault being mounted by the product liability insurance carriers in the country to federalize the whole darn subject and, in effect, to preempt that area with the federal statute mandating under the Supremacy Clause that any state rule that's out of line and that doesn't conform 
to this preemptive statute must yield. In other words, they're out to homogenize the subject. Well, uniformity is a great thing. There's a uniformity upward and a uniformity downward whose real masked purpose is to degrade and lower consumer protection. That's what I call an area of assault, like we've just gone through in the medical negligence field in the States. And in the third place, there's an area of continued growth and breakthrough. Now, as Ted said, be brief. Be brief like the instructor that gave an assignment to the class to write the shortest possible essay on the commingled themes of medicine, religion, and mystery. A little teenage girl wrote out a single sentence solution, rushed up with the essay, and he read the commingled themes of medicine, religion, and mystery. I'm pregnant. My God, who did it? Uh, <laughs> attempting to be brief. And like trial lawyers, to be attention getting. I wonder if you can see this little fella here. This is a toy figurine, and it's a facsimile of the product that was involved in I.N. Cunningham against the Quaker Oats Company, Fisher Toy Division, June 18th, 1981. It involved this little fella, manufactured by this Price Fisher. It's a company town in the outskirts of Buffalo. They marketed it in Ottawa, where there's a toy fair, and the Cunninghams went in and bought the toy school bus and one of these little fellas for their 11th month old toddler. And the family scene, the mother's knitting, the little fellas playing with this thing on the floor, and the father's reading the sports page with his pipe in his mouth, and the mother notices the little fella to try to get to his feet. He stumbles, he's in distress. The father rushed over to collect him, and the little one had swallowed this toy figurine. Well, they upended him and did what they could in extremis to dislodge it, no success. They rush him off to the nearest emergency room. Heroic efforts were made. They finally succeeded in extracting it, but at the point where there had been a suppression of oxygen intake, and the little fellow was a vegetable. And 11 years later, this case was tried in the federal court in Buffalo. And you can imagine the vigorous efforts to remove this case back to Canada for obvious and not so obvious reasons. The level of awards and uh, the availability of a jury, et cetera, et cetera. These non-legal determinants of decision. They fought like tigers to hold that case in the federal court in Buffalo and succeeded. Well, you know, the bright line difference between stateside products liability law and your products liability law is we have strict liability. And the core and crux of this strict liability deal is that as the great Roger J. Trainer, former Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court put it, a great magisterial judge as Alan knows so well, many judges can exert authority Chief Justice Trainer could radiate authority. And he once expressed the, the core and crux of strict liability as follows. Brakeless cars are not best, even if carefully made. <laughs> it is no defense for a defendant to argue, I carefully killed or blinded you. You see, we all know that tremendous development from Winterbottom v. Wright, 10 Meeson and Wellsby, 109, Court of Exchequer in 1842. We all remember that, where the liability of the product supplier is limited to his immediate vendee, which means that in uh, 1983, if you manufacture an electrical baseball pitching machine, that even when it's unplugged, the mere presence of somebody, a janitor, pushing a broom near it, that vibration is enough to trigger off this machine so that it delivers a swift, crippling blow with its throwing arm. How do you like that for safe design and for using care 
to warn. But Winterbottom and Wright says the liability of that product supplier is limited to the immediate vendee, and you know who he is. He's a wholesaler, a jobber, who's not physically endangered, who buys not to use or consume, but to set the product afloat upon a sea of strangers. Winterbottom and Wright is an immunity rule, and that lasted with all its betrayal of the beleaguered consumer. That lasted, as you know, till 1916 in the States in the Great Buey case, and in England to the snail in the bottle case, Donahue versus Stevenson, 1932 AC 562. And that great case out of Australia went to the Privy Council, ran against the Australian knitting mills, 1936 AC 85, that marvelous doctor in the outback of Australia that bought, bought the underpants and wore them for about 10 days before they were laundered, and the perspiration mixing in with the excess sulfites in the underpants. Were they inherently dangerous? This was not a family law case. <laughs> Generated hydrochloric acid. He nearly lost his life. And in the Buey case, New York, 1916, snail in the bottle case, and in the uh, underpants case, the Anglo-American courts came across and elevated consumer protection to a negligence basis. If you're negligent, take out your checkbook. But where does that leave the consuming public when they non-negligently market a defective product? Now, I would assume, without knowing that in Canada, you could get a situation where the innocent purchaser can sue the retailer for breach of implied warranty of merchantability or of uh, fitness for a particular purpose, and it would be no defense that there's absence, uh, that the that privity of contract is present there, so there would be no defense. And if the retailer satisfies a judgment, he can rebound against the jobber, who can rebound against the wholesaler, who can rebound against the manufacturer, who possibly can rebound against a component part maker, and who can shove it back in the laps of a supplier of raw materials. In other words, by a chain of warranty actions in Canada, I would imagine, you could shove the loss back in the lap of the responsible, culpable party by a chain of warranty actions. Yeah, yeah, but if and only if the statute of limitations has not run, if but only if, pardon me, you can get in personam jurisdiction over that defendant under your long arm statute, if but only if there is no disclaimer or exculpatory clause, if and only if he remains solvent, it's a very iffy proposition. And if you can do it by and by, think of the expense in terms of transactional costs, think of the expense in terms of judicial economy. If you can do it in the roundabout way, is there not a crying need for a shortcut to knife through strict liability? Well, that's in the womb of time, perhaps for you. It's very much with us, but you see, in this case, the place of the accident was Ottawa. So our federal court in Buffalo's got to use, or is probably going to use, the law of Canada, negligence. So this was a negligence lawsuit. What's wrong with it, you see? The little kid ate it. He swallowed it. Isn't that a misuse or abuse of a product? I've been reading products liability cases for 40 years. I have yet to see one in which the manufacturer admitted that the product was defective. They always deny defect. And indeed, sometimes there is no defect. Heard of an interesting case the other day at the Harvard Business School at the Products Liability Institute. Guy driving along on his motorcycle. Hits a pothole, low rate of speed, low velocity. Hits the pothole, he's thrown. The bystanders say he's going to be all right. He obviously hasn't snapped his neck. He can walk away from that one. He's out like a mackerel in the moonlight. Autopsy, they check him out. They finally discover the cause of death. A cross pencil in his shirt pocket had penetrated the heart. Now, the cross pencil company is a solvent uh, supplier. But while we have strict liability, we don't have strict, strict, strict liability. And you got to allege and prove a defect. And in short sleeve English, what's a defect? It means something's wrong with the product.
see. Charlie Chaplin and that great movie uh, up in the Klondike uh, where he's surrounded with grizzly bears and blizzards and he's finally reduced to eating a pair of shoes. He did a beautiful job of eating the shoestrings like spaghetti. It was a mouth-watering, great comic achievement in that film. But if he gets a bellyache and gets sick, does he have a cause of action against Tom McCann's shoe company or floor shoe? What's wrong? <laughs> you gotta have a defect. And if somebody perchance, and I hope this is so realistic a hypothetical, that it would apply to every household, especially every legal household in Canada. If a copy of Linden on tort law is left on the top of an unlighted staircase at night, and your uncle seeking to raid the refrigerator or go to the bathroom slips and steps over it and breaks his neck, you have a perfectly solvent, responsible, and very happy publisher, Butterworths Incorporated. I would not recommend throwing good money after bad by suing them. What's wrong with this beautiful book? You got to have a defect even under strict liability. But I've yet to repeat, see the case where they admit that the product was defective. The invariable defense is the sole responsible cause is the misuse or the abuse of the product. Now some products are single purpose products. The toothbrush, what else can you do with the toothbrush? Well, if you're doing a consumer job of shoe shining, you can polish it off with a toothbrush, but what else can you do with a toothbrush? On the other hand, take the low and brow crowd that have just finished their mountain climbing or surfing or what have you. Hey, 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 time for the low and brow. Get out the pipe, get ready to light up. They get the can of pipe tobacco. You gotta pry up the lid. How are you gonna pry up the lid? Look, right. hey, a screwdriver. Using great care, you pry up the lid and the tip of the screwdriver flies off, puts out an eye, it's a serious lawsuit. The man has just lost his spare. See? <laughs> now you bring the action against the screwdriver, come, what's gonna be the defense? This is a misuse or abuse of a product. This is a screwdriver. And its purpose and its application is intended by the product supplier for one purpose. Well, maybe two, a grudging concession, to insert screws, to remove screws, possibly a third one at seminars to unscrew the inscrutable, but <laughs> that's it. That exhausts the spectrum of possible applications. Well now, what emerges from the decided cases and from nowhere else? Oh, Lord Cook was so right. Petiri fontes, go to the decided cases. That's the way to build up your general principles. Ex facto order use, out of the facts is generated and shaped the law. What you find out of the factual decisions is that the product supplier cannot define or dictate the purposes of the product. And defect is tested, not just by intended use, but by unintended, foreseeable misuse. So it would be a question of fact for the jury. Good Lord, people, friends of yours send you cartons of fresh fruit, let's say, from Oregon, Phoenix, Arizona, whatever, and stenciled on the side of the crate will be, remove staples by using screwdriver or similar tool. Defect is tested by unintended but foreseeable uh, misuses. We have the great uh, uh, McCormick against Hanksgraf case in 1967 out of Minnesota. It's what is affectionately known as a company that markets these tip-over steam vaporizers. And uh, you look at the steam vaporizer, you look at the advertising material, the educational material, it talks about may safely be left unattended in the child's bedroom for respiratory ailments and the like. There is no warning in all the educational information about the fact that in the reservoir, like in the pickle jar of this product, the temperature of the water reaches 211 degrees. The housewife would think, well, uh, if I can leave, safely leave it attended in the child's nursery, it only gets hot up in the heating unit where it's converted into steam and gets out the steam ports. But down here, you don't see the water roiling or boiling, and they fail to warn about it reaching scalding temperatures. And worst of all, so you've got to have a defect. they got a loose-lidded top. And that's why this case is affectionately known as the case of the loose-lidded steam vaporizer. 
You get into safety history of the product. 10 to 12 prior examples of children inadvertently tipping it over. And the three-year-old girl, in this case, McCormick against Hanks Grafton, 1967, gets up about 3 a.m. to go to the bathroom, trips over the cord, tips over the steam vaporizer, a slud, sudden gushing of scalding water, and is seriously burned. Her life hung in the balance, the worst injuries in the world, the burn injuries. 74 and a half days of hospitalization. You think she's going back to mother then? No way. The Sister Kenny Institute for 101 days and then to Mayo Brothers for continuing surgery. Keloidal scarring, which means if you cut, it travels so you can't cut and do the reconstructive cosmetic surgery. The little girl. You never lose just a leg. There's the injury to the total person the loss of marriage prospects, the loss of amenities of a life. Mama, will I ever be asked out on a date? Will uh, a young boy ever say to me, may I have the next dance? Will a young man say, will you marry me? Will I ever be able to say to the other young women, I'm going to have a baby? You never lose just a leg, the loss of amenities of life, and we've learned from your decisions and from the English decisions. Wise against uh, K and uh, West, uh, the, the Shepherd case out of the House of Lords, the loss of amenities. Even though you're comatose, there can be a painless loss of humanity. And if you're a vegetable, you may not feel pain, but you don't feel joy or ecstasy either. Loss of amenities of life, a painless loss of humanity. So that, you see, the defect in the tip over steam vaporizer case was for three dollars and a half. They could have had a screw on, child guard top. That case went for $150,000 way back in 1967. And when you win one of those, the word gets around, hey, that's Sally Robbins out of Duluth is the vaporizer man. He's hauled out to San Francisco, tries another one. Settled for 187.5. Back in the federal court in Duluth, and he says, may it please the court, they had 10 or 12 of these accidents before my first case. They have failed to recall and redesign. They're still peddling these loose lidded vapor. And in view of that, may it please the court, we move to amend the complaint to insert account for punitive damage. They still don't respond. They got three million of these things in inventory. They finally respond, how and why? Because their products liability carrier finally did the right thing. An insurance company gets to know a lot about risk and the calibration of risk and the management of risk. And they call Hanks Craft in one day and say, you got a hundred claims against you for these tip over steam. We don't have to renew your coverage. You're on notice. We're not going to renew it unless you recall and reformulate the design. That's an insurance company putting pressure on the pinch point, minimizing and reducing risk. And then Hanks Graff recalled and redesigned. And one of my favorite little exhibits to carry around the country is a full page spread, color ad, Hanks Graff model 202A. Please note the automatic cutoff when the water level goes down through use, there's an automatic cutoff, there can be no Fire, note also the child guard top, the screw on top, no sudden spillage of scalding water. That's tort law at its best when it plays professor. Because the message is a fence at the top of a cliff is better than an ambulance in the valley below. Accident prevention better than accident compensation. Prime purpose of tort law to compensate for harm, but it has a secondary and still precious purpose, the prophylactic purpose, accident reduction. So you got to have a defect, see? What's wrong with Linden on torts? It's a superb product. It's uh, without defect, fail or flaw. But you got to have, what was the defect here, see? You have to use care 
in designing the product, that's the place to get rid of danger, on the drawing boards. Pernicious products should be scrapped in the factory, not dodged in the home. That's the place to get rid of excessive preventable danger on the drawing boards. What's wrong with it? You've got to have a defect. Say, you're not supposed to eat things like this. You're not supposed to eat firecrackers, even though they're covered in rustling, attractive red paper, lozenge-shaped, with a pleasant smell, and small. Why, the medical profession has a term, pica, P-I-C-A, the craving of children for unnatural foods, these slum lords that have these tumble-down slum apartments where the plaster peels and flakes and falls, and these little habitues of these places, and even sons of them as well, crawl around on their little bottoms, and they eat this stuff. It has a lead-based paint, and they get irreversible brain damage because they eat it, and the medical people know about it. You see, I think it's the important thing for any lawyer, not just a trial lawyer, is that sudden moment when he's hit with a lightning bolt and he realizes, as Holmes says, I'm not God. I'm not the smartest man in the world. We're all ignorant. We're just ignorant about different things. And what I know is largely erroneous. So you approach the case like an infant. I abandon all my presuppositions. I know I don't know. There's hope for me. And then I call in the experts. And I say, shoot the sherbet to me. Herbert! <laughs> Explain it to me. And the experts will tell you, you and I don't know. We know we don't know. There's hope for us. But the experts know that every year in the states between 500,000 and 600,000 children under the age of 15 are injured or killed by the ingestion of what they laconically call toxic substances. They'll eat the firecrackers. They'll eat the shoe polish. I tell you that a soda pop bottle with a corrosive solution or a caustic solution under the sink is an invitation to heartbreak. I've listened to the parents come forward and say, know what you mean, looking like American Gothic. It happened to us. Unintended, but foreseeable. Maybe not to you and me, but to the experts. Every year, 500,000, 600, they have poison control centers all around the United States, craving unnatural substances. So a foreseeable misuse is no defense. Heck, you take this whole darn doctrine of, un of crashworthiness. This is not just an automobile doctrine. It applies to airplanes. It applies to buses. It applies to trains. It applies, would you believe, to electric utility poles. And that whole darn doctrine is premised on what? That these vehicles will get involved in expectable collisions. That's not their intended. But three out of four vehicles that leave Flint or Detroit or River Rouge will have blood on them in their expectable, useful life. Unintended but foreseeable uses so that care must be exercised to see that this product, any product, is reasonably safe, comes now the nub of it, in its expectable environment of use. And a toy for children is a household product. And once you say household product, whether it's tigress, cologne, or whatever it is, if it's a household product, there's the patter of little feet. Every hour is the children's hour. You got to have a defect. What's the defect? You're getting it. You're beginning to feel it. Swallowability is the defect. And you pin him down on deposition. Did you consult with pediatricians? Give them a little time. Or pathologists before you designed this product. Why didn't you put a vent, a hole through it? Why not? Would it have bankrupted you? You're in pretty bad shape if it would. See? 
Did you consult before? If they say no, they're in trouble. If they say yes, state the name and address of the doctors, then you check them out. They said yes, they checked them out. They hadn't consulted with the pediatrician or the pathologist. And there was expert testimony from the American Association of Standards and Engineers that this was a defective product that could have been invented at any child for any toy for a child of a young age. And this they marketed for children between one and four years. The teething period, for heaven's sake, should be at least five inches in one dimension to prevent swallowability. So I would say this is going to be a continuing dynamic element if the chilling hand of federal legislation does not come down to freeze this common law uh, development. You've got to have a defect. Negligent design. That case went for $3,100,000. No reason for that case to be farmed out to the United States, except for the best reasons in the world. You see, this case belonged back in Canada. And I think, with all respect, when your law in this area approaches the 20th century, it is more likely to stay and remain in Canada. Let me say a few words about mental suffering. I think when we say mental suffering, you know, what do we think of? Subdivided into two parts. One is the intentional infliction of extreme mental suffering. In shirts leave English, the tort of outrage. And the other, of course, is the negligent infliction of mental suffering. Now, I think usually the attitude of a seasoned trial lawyer is, give me some broken bones, some torn flesh, show me some flowing blood, you know. Don't tell me you feel bad. You've got an aching back. Everybody feels bad, you see. We live in an age of anxiety, the aunts of generation. You know, give me some torn flesh and broken bones. The lesson, of course, is that there can be a wounding of the mind. My memory goes back to the First World War as a kid. I can remember seeing some of those men come back that they explained to us were suffering from what they call shell shock. In World War II, uh, it was called battle fatigue, was it not? In Vietnam, I don't know what they called it, uh, madness, whatever. But uh, that meant that you had, at one point, thousands and thousands of servicemen that were institutionalized in soundproof rooms, padded walls, brushed by the wing of madness. And yet their flesh had never been torn or touched by shot or shell. They're all levels and integrations of uh, mental illness, and in, indeed it can be totally disabling. And a hysterical paralysis can be just as disabling in terms of function as a severed spine. You don't have to be smart or sophisticated to get onto that. Now, I said divided into two parts. Intentional infliction of extreme mental suffering, the tort of outrage. The old granddaddy case on it, Wilkinson and Downton, and Alan treats very well in his book, where the defendant, a practical joker, they are commonly uh, involved in our torts case books, these PGAs, these practical jokers, knowing that a wife was in frail hell just to get a rise out of her. Told her a big whopping lie. Said your old man fell in a concrete mixer and uh, he's had a bad accident. You have to come down to the hospital and bring some bandages and wrap, bind up his wounds. Hurry up. You see? She was in frail hell. He was trying to make her feel bad. He succeeded. She, her sanity hung in the balance. She nearly died. Now, that's not an old-fashioned uh, assault and battery case. You could call it an intangible battery if you want, because it was an intentional invasion of her peace of mind, a psychological aggression against her peace of mind. So the accent is on intentional infliction, extreme mental suffering. I think the test is, say, if I turn to the fellow sitting next to me in the subway and say, hey, get a load of this, this is what happened, if he listens to you and says, that's outrageous, you're in a pretty good position to predict that you're going to have a cause of action where it exceeds the bounds of decency, where it's atrocious misconduct, intolerant, not to be tolerated. Fast example. You don't need a million examples, right? Fast example. Recent Tennessee case that went for heavy damages where a mother had a stillbirth. She was all upset. She had been cooking this little infant, 
looking forward to it, dreaming about it, and so on. That's a stillbirth. She feels bad. There's a problem of how to bury it. She's all upset about that. And the doctor in there, don't worry. We're old hands of this. It's happened many times. Leave it to us. You've got enough worries. We'll take care of it. Okay. Months later, she comes back for the postnatal checkup, and she's sitting around, and of course, she's waiting, right? She's a patient. She's waiting. And you look on that desk, and he's got the National Geographic and the Field and Stream, all those goody, exciting magazines. They don't, don't have the good Vanity Fair in there. They might have Medical Economics. That's a great book. That's a book that all the doctors read. They don't read Physician's Desk Reference. The PDR, they don't read that enough to get the side effects of these drugs, but they read that medical economics. 25 ways to use your wife as a tax deduction. <laughs> How to collect those delinquent bills. It's all dog-eared, you see. Gray's Anatomy, the internist dust on the shelf, you see. So she's sitting around, nothing interesting to read, but there, see, they've got her medical file out. Well, human nature being, let's see what's really the trouble with me. And she looks at it, and she reads some very disturbing stuff. Starts screaming for the doctor and the nurse, where's my baby? You said you were going to bury it. And the head nurse of the hospital, a termagant battleship of the third class, said, you want to see your baby? Follow me, this stone-faced lady. Takes her into the laboratory, reaches up into a jar of formaldehyde, says, there's your baby, all shriveled and wizened and floating around in the jar. Too far advanced in fetal life to dispose of otherwise, kept in a jar. And she felt bad. You understand it, she felt bad. Let the jury use the adjective. You give them nouns, the, the baby. She saw the baby, that's a noun. Then the jury says, outrageous, we'll teach them a lesson. Then you send them a message, send them a message, you see. Substantial. And that's the tort of outrage. It's not old fashioned actionable assault. It wasn't battery. They didn't touch her, except they damaged, they assaulted her psyche. Intentional infliction of extreme mental suffering. And this is a collateral way of handling landlords for abusive, outrageous tactics. For handling employers, notwithstanding the exclusivity bar of the Workmen's Compensation Act. The exclusivity bar says you got a personal injury or death, work connected arising out of in the course of the employment. Comps are exclusive remedy. And compensation is nothing. It's the most scabby, scaly, scurvy, scruffy, scrofulous area of accident law. And the only thing that makes comp look good is when it's all you've got. See? But there are times that exclusivity bar is related to personal injury and death, traumatic stuff. Whereas the wounding of the mind can be non-physical injury outside the compact, so you invite the employer and his carrier to pull up a chair <laughs> and go after them. So it gives you collateral remedies in the employer uh, relationship, uh, the debt collection agency. The outrageous tactics of debt collectors would strain credulity if we were to catalog some of the devices that they're, uh, they're using to collect these uh, delinquent uh, debts. Uh, so that's intentional infliction of extreme mental suffering. Have a recent case where a air traffic controller, okay, Patco, saw that uh, one of his colleagues, uh, Chowderhead, had two planes on a collision course, and he he took emergency action, and the catastrophe was avoided. Then he goes around and expresses his deep dismay about this thing that almost happened. We've got to log it in, put it in the record, and they say, you're not, you, you're not a company man. You're not going along with the unions. And they sent him to Coventry. They did a job on him to make life miserable, to make his professional life a can of worms. They hounded him out of St. Louis Lambert Airport. They drove him out to Akron, Ohio, if you can imagine a worse fate. <laughs> and he, he, he broke down. They did a job on him, psychological aggression, intentional infliction of extreme mental suffering, $800,000 against the union, intentional infliction of extreme mental suffering. Now, on the negligent infliction of extreme mental suffering, 
You know the old rule was you couldn't recover for the physical consequences of fright or shock negligently inflicted in the absence of a contemporaneous impact. They wanted that little touching, see, to give you a circumstantial guarantee of the trustworthiness of the claim. Show us an impact, man. See? Now, of course, the impact rule was supposed to eliminate the fake claim, right? The courts must not be a dumping ground of fake or spurious claims. So prove it's valid, man. Show us an impact. You, see? you can understand what they're getting at. But if the client is a fourflush, and if his lawyer is a prostitute, they'll get you an impact. See? If they can lie about where the collision took place, the speed of both vehicles, whether the light was green, red, or orange, they'll lie about that by hypothesis and get you an impact. They'll fib about that. The impact rule never foreclosed a fake claim. What it would do would dismiss legitimate or valid claims where the client wouldn't lie, you see. What it did was to say that if you negligently scratch a man, you liable. But if you negligently scare him to death, no impact, no liability. Is that good medicine? Is that good psychiatry? Is that good public policy? Is that good law? Well, they drew a bead on that one, and they got rid of it. And there are only about three states now that still cling to the outmoded impact rule. Then they went from that to the zone of danger. You don't have to show that you were touched or hit or impacted, but uh, you have to show that you were placed in physical jeopardy, that it almost hit you, and then you had the heart attack, or the stroke, or the miscarriage, or whatever, you see. What then do we do with the case of the mother? And this is a very familiar script, right? In Canada, in the States, everybody should have a hobby. One of my little hobbies is collecting cases to show that not all physicians hate trial lawyers. Where the physician gets hurt and sues the other operating surgeon who ruined his dominant hand, you see. Those are fun cases, you see. They don't all hate trial lawyers. I, so I, I like these cases where you have this following scenario. Where the mother is looking out the dining room window and there's the brakeless Greyhound bus. Take the bus and leave the drinking to us, all right? There's the brakeless Greyhound bus that runs down and kills her little three-year-old daughter, the apple of her eye, right before her eyes. And the mother feels bad, you see? Now, sometimes the mother has a heart attack, woe against Warrington, a fatal accident in response to this harrowing sight. Or we'll have a stroke, or a decompensated heart, or what have you, real physical consequence. There are a large number of these cases where the parent bystander these are bystander recovery cases, where there's no touching, and where the victim is not within the zone of injurious impact, there's no zone of danger. It's a bystander situation. He's on the roof, on the widow's walk, looking out of the front room, coming back from the bridge club, coming back from the local delicatessen and sees the crumpled body, the flower of the family lying broken in the dusty roadway and feels bad, you see. Now, is that, does that strain your credulity when I say that the mother feels bad and sometimes has a heart attack? We have a recent case in Massachusetts where a negligently operated school bus, negligent in multiple respects, brought about the traumatic impact of a young school child, the daughter of the family. The mother did not actually see it. She was not a bystander. But their home was right across the street, the school bus discharger right across from her home. And the mother rushes out and then sees the flower of the family broken, facial and pelvic fractures and so on, lying there in the roadway. The mother felt bad. The ambulance is summoned, and while they're taking the teenager to the hospital with the mother, the mother has the fatal heart attack. And thereafter, the father, who did not witness it or hear it, beyond bystander, learns about it, and he has a fatal heart attack. See? You can't invent that. There it is, for the trier of facts. But if you insist on impact, they're out. If you insist on zone of danger, they're out. They were not physically endangered by this wayward school bus. And if you insist on eyeball observation, they're out. But they came upon the scene of the accident on the heels of the accident. Is there not 
enough circumstantial guarantee of the trustworthiness of the claim. And uh, my own court, the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts, in one decision, talk about a quantum leap of doctrine, knocked the brains out of impact, knocked the brains out of the zone of danger, and said, eyeball observation isn't necessary. And we have a case that even goes further than that, where the husband is on the job, so right away you're thinking, work-connected accident. And he is uh, clobbered by some falling beams in a defective sling. Now, anytime you get a case like that, you know what you're thinking. You've got a comp claim, right? Work-connected accident. And what do you use the benefits for? To fund the tort action. If you've got a work-connected injury, man, to stay alive, you've got a third party in. So you look for the financially responsible third party. It's a product liability case. And we've seen these cases where the guy specializes in comp and nothing else. He gets blinders. Comp is all he sees. So the fellow loses an arm in a power press mishap, as they like to call him, misadventure. I've heard defense lawyers in their cups of it said, oh, you talking about our power press, you mean the amputation machine? That's the way they... <laughs> uh, so he says, that's a good comp claim. And he gets some good comp benefits. And uh, then the calendar and the clock are clicking. 